Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kobe Rizek, and I'm the current president of the Buckley Program. Before I introduce our guest this afternoon, I want to say a few words about the program. First, for those of you who don't know, the William F. Buckley Jr. Program is an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity and open political discussion at Yale. We do so in a variety of ways, including hosting lectures, dinner seminars, firing line debates, and an annual conference. Our over 300 Buckley Fellows have a wide range of political beliefs, but they all stand united against the formation of a liberal echo chamber on campus. By providing Yale students with a forum to engage meaningfully with serious conservative thought, the Buckley program forwards its mission of a more open and more representative political atmosphere, especially at a university where the mission is the cultivation and creation of new knowledge, Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives, including those of the right, must be heard and examined in good faith. You can learn more about the program and how to become a fellow on our website, buckleyprogram.com. The deadline to become a fellow this semester is April 1st, which is a little bit of a move from our original deadline of March 23rd. Um, so if you know of anyone, any friends who would like to apply, please let them know. All Yale undergraduate and graduate students are eligible to become Buckley Fellows. Next, the Buckley Program summer internship deadlines are quickly approaching. The program generally, generously offers $4,000 for funding of summer internships. March 1st is the deadline for internships at both the National Review and the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. All Yale students are eligible to apply, not just Buckley Fellows, and can do so on Yale's career website, Simplicity. Also a reminder that next Wednesday, March 4th, we'll be having a firing line debate on fossil fuel divestment between Nick Loris of the American Enterprise Institute and Dr. Tim Wieskell of Harvard University. We're honored today to be hosting Dr. Michael Pillsbury and his wife, Mrs. Susan Pillsbury, for a lecture on the timely topic of U.S.-China strategy under President Donald Trump. Dr. Pillsbury is a senior fellow and director for Chinese strategy at the Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C. He is a distinguished defense policy advisor, former high-ranking government official, and the author of numerous books and reports on China. He has been recognized by President Donald Trump as a leading authority on China and a key mind behind U.S.-China military and economic strategy today. During the Reagan administration, Dr. Pillsbury was Assistant Undersecretary of Defense for Policy Planning and was responsible for the implementation of the covert aid program known as the Reagan Doctrine. From 1975 to 76, while an analyst at the RAND Corporation, he published articles in foreign policy and international security recommending that the United States establish intelligence and military ties with China. This proposal was publicly commended by President Reagan, Henry Kissinger, James Schleichinger, and later became U.S. policy during the Carter and Reagan administrations. Dr. Pillsbury served on the staff of four United States Senate committees from 1978 to 1984 and from 1986 to 91. As a staff member on these committees, he drafted the Senate Labor Committee version of the legislation that enacted the U.S. Institute of Peace in 1984. He also assisted in drafting the legislation to create the National Endowment for Democracy uh, and the annual requirement for a Department of Defense report on Chinese military readiness and power. In 1992, under President George H.W. Bush, Dr. Pillsbury was Special Assistant for Asian Affairs in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Dr. Pillsbury is a current member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the International Institute for Strategic Studies. He is also the author of several books, including China Debates the Future Security Environment, The Hundred Year Marathon, China's Secret Strategy to Replace America as the Global Superpower, and editor of Chinese Views on Future Warfare. Dr. Pillsbury was educated at Stanford and Columbia University, where he received his PhD. Please join me in warmly welcoming to Yale and to the Buckley program, Dr. Michael Pillsbury. You think the microphone works? Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. I gather that not everybody in the audience is necessarily a Bill Buckley conservative, but that's, our, that's the host in the initiative. Uh, to ask me to talk about China policy and my own personal views on uh, where the U.S.-China relationship is going. The first thing I want to mention is my pride in the 
success of this book over the last five years. When it first came out, I had no idea if it would sell more than about 20 copies. My friends and wife, maybe next door neighbor. Instead, it became the number one best-selling book on China and was translated so far into seven languages. In fact, the Chinese military uh, had a ceremony to hand me the Chinese translation of the book, which was done by a lady colonel in the Chinese army who herself has a PhD, and the translation is perfect. The only problem is, it was explained to me, the book in China is considered secret. It's for sale only to Communist Party officials or military officers. Some people have bought it in Chinese bookstores, and I have a few copies I was given in the ceremony. And I ask, why isn't this translated? Why isn't this for sale to everybody in China? Obviously, I had a selfish motive. <clears throat> if 1.3 billion people, if even, if even half of them would buy the book, and I would make a dollar on each, I could endow a big building here at Yale, <laughs> the Michael Pillsbury Center for Chinese Studies. And the Chinese military officer said, Dr. Pillsbury, surely you know the answer to your own question. I said, no, I don't. I, would, I really think it should be translated and available for everybody in China, not just the Communist Party. He said, sir, chapter three. The Chinese people are not ready yet for your chapter three. So you all should be asking yourselves, what is in chapter three? It's the heart of the book. It's based on declassified CIA and White House documents about what the US-China secret relationship has been over the last 40 years. In other words, what you were taught in school before this book came out may not have been entirely accurate about US-China relations. Generally speaking, they were much closer than anybody realized. And some would say, and still are. So if you read the daily newspapers about, oh my god, war with China, conflict, trade war, South China Sea, you might be thinking, this is, this is terrible. These two countries never got along and never will. What this book argues is that's not true. That's not true. The level of cooperation, in fact, and because it's the Buckley program, I want to underline this, Republican presidents, conservative Republican presidents are the ones who pushed the US-China cooperation, secret cooperation, the furthest. So when Nixon and Kissinger first got involved with China, one document I was allowed to reveal was the United States said to the Chinese military, if you get invaded, we'll help you. In fact, more than that, we think you're concentrating all your bombers on one air base. So it'd be quite difficult for you to survive if the Russians attack you. We'll link you up to our satellites in space. We'll give you the technology so you can disperse your bombers if you're under fear of attack. This is one of many examples. I give a total of 12 examples of US-China secret cooperation. Show of hands, how many of you here ever heard this before, that the US was going to defend China against invasion? Put your hand up. Two. So I'm already trying to argue against the conventional view that there's inevitable friction and conflict between the US and China. And some of you may have seen a James Bond movie where James Bond is teamed up with the beautiful Chinese lady colonel. Not the one who translated my book, by the way. Another fictional beautiful Chinese spy lady. You would think that's just James Bond, just fiction, until you read chapter three. 
and you find out that the US and China secret services cooperated to cause Cambodia to become free again to expel the Vietnamese occupying army. This was done under, was just done under some left wing president who was foolish to cooperate with communist China? No. This program was started in 1982 by President Ronald Reagan. If you're a good conservative, maybe you don't think Nixon is conservative enough, but you certainly think Ronald Reagan is conservative enough. He greatly increased the secret cooperation between the CIA and the Pentagon and their Chinese counterparts. So not only were the Vietnamese driven out of Cambodia by this joint secret cooperation, which involved other countries. But then the program was increased by 20 times bigger. And the US and China cooperated in Afghanistan, to, again, to drive home an occupying army. The Soviet Russian army occupied Afghanistan, was going to stay there pretty much permanently. And the US and China cooperated. I cite some figures that the US purchased under President Reagan, secretly, $2 billion of Chinese weapons to give to the Afghan rebels to drive the Soviet army out. There's a series of, this, of these examples of secret cooperation that I think set a positive foundation for cooperation between the US and China, no matter how much tension or friction or confrontation there might be. So if you want more examples, you'll have to buy the book and read chapter three, which you can do because you're here, not in China. Then I have a long discussion of what's little known. How did China create this magnificent economy in which they're now the number two in the world, the roughly 75% of our economy, according to one way of counting. According to another way of counting, with if, you're, if there's some real policy nerds here, you know what PPP is. Who knows what PPP is? Put your hand up. Oh, it's 10, 15. Say it. Okay, how, did, how does China do against the United States and purchase power parity as of 2015? Anybody know? Surpassed us, very good. So how could China, which in the 70s was only 10%, I'll give you a sort of show of hands here, 10% of us, this is China in the 60s and 70s, this is China today starting to pass us. How'd that happen? Where did this Chinese economic growth come from? If you ask Chinese Communist Party members, they say, well, the, the guidance of the Communist Party of China and the hard work of the Chinese people. That's sort of true. But where did they get the idea? One particular idea is China had been uh, essentially ruined by Soviet advice in the 50s to create these massive dinosaurs called state-owned enterprises copying the Soviet system. No profit, no accounting, no, they didn't have prices. All the things you think an economy should have, bank loans, capital, foreign investment, accounting system, prices set by the market. How much of that did China have in 1972? Zero, none. They didn't know what an accountant was. They didn't have private banks. Fast forward, now they're surpassing the Americans. Where'd they get these ideas? Anybody want to guess? The United States. The United States, upon invitation from China, after a lot of hints, sent Nobel Prize winning economists to China. Business school professors, bankers, and designed the Chinese economic system to take those state-owned enterprises 
and turn them into profitable companies which are how big today? Here's what those companies were in the 70s. Remember I said loss, uh, no profit, no capital, no banking system, no prices. All that was changed by Americans. In fact, some Americans, Hank Paulson of Goldman Sachs, written a book about it, where he describes the shock on the face of the Chinese premier, Zhu Rongji, when Hank Paulson goes in to see him and says, look, you've got all these little uh, telecommunications companies all around China. You could put them all together. You have the power as a Communist Party system. You can put all these little telecommunications companies together. You can have the biggest telecommunications company in the world. And Goldman Sachs will sell shares in New York on the stock market and you'll get from five to ten billion dollars for the shares. And you can imagine on the Chinese side a little suspicion. Like, why would you do that? And the clue is given, the answer is given in Hank Paulson's book. He says, there's one thing you must not do. Don't let Morgan Stanley do this. So the Chinese began to understand, OK, American companies provide advice. This all happened. The company was created, and it became the largest telecommunications company in the world. But that's not all. More than 100 of these companies were created. More than 100. So this year, when the Fortune magazine publishes its annual list of the largest 500 companies in the world, 20 years ago, China had how many companies on the list of the top 500 companies in the world 20 years ago, year 2000? Any guesses? Who said that? That's right. And today, two months ago, Fortune released its list. Always this, in the past, America dominated the list. The most companies of the highest capitalizations. Two months ago, what country has the most of these top 500 companies. Want to guess? Did someone say France? No. Japan? No. China? So how'd this happen? Well, that's a long chapter in this book where I show how American advisors, World Bank advisors, the Chinese leaders themselves go on trips to compare how do countries become wealthy, how do they become rich. And I dis have one dis discussion in here between the Chinese leader of the time and the World Bank when he asked, how can China catch up with America? And the World Bank answer at first was, you can't. The Americans have too much of a lead on you. They've been up at this for 200 years. You're poor and backward. And then one World Bank expert said, well, there is a way. There is a way. You can take these state-owned enterprises, peel away the losing parts, have a market with prices, bring in American business school professors, teach all over China how to have management. And by the way, you could call them by a different name. Don't call them state-owned enterprises. Call them, anybody know the answer? It's two words. Big words in China now. National champions. National champions. They represent the genius and the respect that's owed to the Chinese people. And it's all come true. There's 129 companies now. The most of any country are on the Fortune 500 list. Now, there's a long list, if we had a Pentagon-style briefing slides here, we could go through the number of areas in which China is now number one in the world. You can pick them at random. Beer drinking, who drinks the most beer? China. Supercomputer, China. So quite a long list. But again, unless you buy my book and read that chapter, you're not going to know how did China create this model. 
And even today, this is, the matter, this is a matter of high politics in China. Because the story from the Chinese side for a long time was, well, this was all Deng Xiaoping and the team around Deng Xiaoping. But now recently, in the last two or three years, another name has come forward as the genius who thought up the system, who reformed China. And he may have done it by making secret trips to Hong Kong, one or more. This is the really big question. Who am I talking about? Who is the person today in China who's being discussed as a bigger, greater reformer to create our Chinese system than Deng Xiaoping himself, who in the past got all the credit? Who knows? This is back to 1978 now. Yeah, 70, this is in the 70s. She was an assistant to the defense minister at the time, 23 years old. OK, no guesses? You're close. Xi Jinping's father. Xi Jinping's father was criticized at the time for being too much of a reformer. He was in charge of Guangzhou. Secret visits to Hong Kong, ideas about how to reform, and the creation of what's called the special economic zones to try a new approach to economics in these various zones around China. First, just a few. One, you may know the name, Shenzhen, headquarters of Huawei. Then it grew to a whole province, Hainan province. So if Xi Jinping's father did this, Shouldn't Xi Jinping be proud of it? Shouldn't he be a reformer? Why would we have all of this closing of the Chinese market now if Xi Jinping's own father is the hero? Interesting question, isn't it? And that's another chapter in the book. Something called the Ying Pai. What does Ying Pai know? Lots of Mandarin speakers in the audience. Any Ying Pai in here today? Ying Pai, Ge Pai. Two different points of view. What's Ge Pai? Doves, the doves, the reformers, the free market people. More freedom of speech, political pluralism, elections. Ying Pai. Ying means eagle or hawk. The hawks wanted to keep the Chinese economy under state control. Same thing with social and political reform bad. So you didn't all put your hands up and say, Ying Pai, of course, hardliners. Who could give me an example of a hardliner in China? Somebody's opposed to these reforms, because there are lots of them. One who wasn't around to do much opposition is Chairman Mao Zedong himself. Remember, he put the president of China in jail, had him tortured to death, and his wife paraded around. It'd be like President Trump putting Mike Pence in prison and torturing him to death because he didn't have the right political views. Chairman Mao was a Ying Pai. Some, after he died, 1976, a group was formed to undo the previous structure. You think this matters today in 2020? You think the Ying Pai and reformer debate still goes on? I'll tell you somebody who does. President Trump's trade negotiator, Ambassador Bob Lighthizer, has said in his testimony to Congress, the only way the trade agreement's going to work is if the reformers in China carry it out. So reformers, hardliners, it seems to have been with us for many, many decades in China. A little bit like conservatives and progressives over here. But we Americans tend to have a very short-sighted view that politics only takes place here. Over in China, it's all those Chinese are unified. They all think the same way. They all want to do the same thing. What if that were not true? That's another chapter in the book. The implications for us of, the, of politics in Beijing. And I already gave you a clue. The politics get so extreme sometimes that they kill each other. 
or put each other in jail. It's not just go back to your house and wish you'd won the New Hampshire primary. It's go to jail or be executed. So do you think we should pay attention to politics in Beijing? I do. Do all China experts agree with me? No, they don't. Does China openly say, yes, Dr. Pillsbury is right. We have all this cutthroat politics in China. We're fighting between hardliners and reformers every day. How many people think China says that officially? How many think China denies the existence of politics at the top in China? So it's, that's 100%, by the way. So how, many, so how much do we pay attention to politics in China? A little bit or a lot? I've already quoted the president's trade advisor saying the only way this trade deal is going to work is if the reformers step up and implement it. So when you visit China or when you meet the Chinese, what would be something important to know about him or her? Where do you stand on some of these key issues? And it's quite easy to find out. At first, the Chinese you're talking to may not want to voluntarily get typed because there could be consequences. But there's ways of saying, gee, do you think we should remove all price controls in China and have a free market or not? Gee, do you think state-controlled banks should make loans at low interest rates and basically subsidize losing corporations? Yes or no? There's a whole range of these questions. And I'm proposing to you that in the future of your lives, you think about Chinese politics as something like politics all over the world. Nobody would walk up to somebody and say, hey, I love Bill Buckley and Ronald Reagan, don't you? And have the person say, no, I really like Obama and Hillary and Jimmy Carter. We would know there's a difference in worldview there. We need to pay the same respect to the Chinese, especially when they're not going to volunteer it. They're not going to have a little pin that says Xi Jinping's father was the real reformer. And somebody else having a pen say, no, Deng Xiaoping was the real reformer. No. It's going to take homework and understanding of Chinese politics to know what to do. Now, somebody's so moved by what I'm saying that they're playing a, a French horn in the next room. So I guess that means that's the end of the lecture. Now, you're interested in American policy toward China and Chinese policy toward America today in 2020. And I have a chapter for you about that, the last chapter. It's the policy recommendations, 12. I have kind of a, a joke that we're, we've been addicted to China, addicted to helping China, being blind to Chinese politics, not understanding that we're nurturing a company, a country to surpass us that may not have our best intentions in mind. Therefore, if that's right, if, the, if you're with me for the first nine chapters, then what are some of the steps we could take to do about it? And that's where President Trump came in. He started saying in his campaign that China was the biggest challenge to America, the trade relationship was unbalanced, and a expressing a series of grievances toward the Chinese trade relationship and saying something very witty. Many people thought it was quite funny. He said, you'd think he would say the Chinese did this and they are monsters. We've got to fight them. No, on the contrary. He repeatedly said, more than 10 times on my count, he repeatedly said, I don't blame China. I don't blame China. Who did he blame? previous American presidents of both parties for being bad negotiators and allowing this to happen. So what did that mean for President Trump's strategy toward China? Who's the first person he should turn to to try to improve the trade relationship? 
Any nominations from the floor? Who's the first person he got in contact with? Somebody said it. I can, they're whispering it because they're not sure. Xi Jinping. Who does President Trump say is his friend? Over and over, Xi Jinping. For phase two of the trade deal, who is President Trump going to Beijing to see? Xi Jinping. So my earlier point about building the foundation of secret cooperation, then being aware of Chinese politics, he's into a third major point. If China decides to reform, have fair relationship with the United States, not have a war, who are the two people who can work it out? The only two people who can work it out. By the way, the same concept occurred to President Nixon. He knew he, when he went to Beijing, he had to see Chairman Mao. And there had to be a photo on the front page of the Chinese newspaper of Nixon and Mao together so that all of China would know Chairman Mao blesses this Republican conservative president coming to China. Because the day before, when Nixon arrived in Beijing, was there a big crowd to meet him at the airport? 1972, February, the same month? No, nobody there. A few Chinese leaders came to shake his hand at the bottom of the Air Force One ramp. The head of Ethiopia had visited a few weeks earlier. Haile Selassie, for those of you who remember the head of Ethiopia. When he came to Beijing, there are several hundred thousand screaming crowds coming out. Long live Ethiopia. Long live Haile Selassie. The president of the free world arrives, ending hostility of 22 years. Who's there to greet him? Nobody. Nobody. After the meeting with Chairman Mao, who blesses the relationship, somehow Nixon's a good guy, and Americans are not the enemies we've been talking about for the last 20 years, then what happened? Tremendous opening of relationship from both sides. So when President Trump had his chance, he could have worked through the Chinese ambassador in Washington. He could have asked his allies in Japan or elsewhere to be intermediaries. He could have written a letter. No. Where did he invite Xi Jinping? Come for a formal state dinner in the White House? Nope. Come play golf in Mar-a-Lago. Bring your wife, which he did. The only problem was Xi Jinping doesn't play golf. So it was a short visit. But from the Mar-a-Lago meeting in April 2017, the U.S.-China relationship was, rest was restructured completely. In the past, the, the two cabinets, the cabinet secretaries of both sides, met together, either Washington or Beijing, roughly once a year, and each read off their talking points to the other side. And then they both went home. President Trump and Xi Jinping decided to restructure that, cancel that unproductive approach, and instead have four dialogues, four dialogue mechanisms is the Chinese phrase, with two cabinet secretaries meeting against two Chinese cabinet secretaries with the staff an agenda, solve problems, do things. And that's the structure that was set up. All of those two, two plus two, they're called, meetings have now taken place. The tr phase one of the trade deal has been signed. So enormous progress. So what's the problem? Why invite me here to talk about China today? If there's no problem, there'd be no reason to think about this anymore. Check the box, everything's OK. Well, not exactly. Not exactly. Because once China began to become more economically powerful, using their ancient strategic writings, they said, you know, the hegemon of an international relations system Chinese are talking about 500 BC, the so-called Warring States period. Once a rising power 
threatens the old hegemon in China. It happened five times during the warring states. When a rising power challenges the old hegemon, what happens? The old hegemon usually wipes out the rising power. There's even a Chinese proverb to describe the situation. It's called uh, Wan Ding Zhong Qing, to, to ask the weight of the cauldrons. Ding is a three-legged structure that the emperor in the warring states had nine of these. Each state would send one to the emperor, and he had them around the palace. And once a fatal mistake was made by a rising power, he asked the grandson of the emperor, who was visiting on a friendly visit, something along the lines of, it's, this is Confucius, writes this story. Gee, how much, how heavy are those cauldrons in the palace? Now, you and I might think that's nothing. It's just cocktail party conversation. How are you today? Nice weather we're having. How much do the cauldrons weigh in the palace? But in the Chinese ancient story, to ask the weight of the emperor's cauldrons means you covet, you have ambition to replace the emperor, and you're already thinking about the nine cauldrons in the palace. So what do you suppose happened to that rising power who revealed too early his ambition before he had the power to carry it out? He was wiped out. His whole country was eliminated. So we have this same story in our own political science, international relations theory of literature. It's called regime change dynamics. It's a very fancy way of putting it. But sometimes when the hegemon is replaced by a new hegemon, there's trouble, war. So if you're the Chinese leadership, as you're getting closer and closer to surpassing the Americans, what do you naturally think the Americans might do about that? To say, welcome to the club, we're so happy. You're surpassing us. You know, we created your system, so we have great pride in what you're doing. A few Americans think, think that way, and a few Chinese too. But the majority thought, no, we're going to need protection. We're going to need protection as we go through 20 or 30 years of transition when the Americans begin to wake up that we're not poor little China anymore. We are superior to the US in almost every possible way. If we do that in a defenseless way, what happened to the state leader who asked about the weight of the cauldrons is going to happen to us. So Deng Xiaoping gave some wonderful advice. As at first, it was secret. Then it came out later on. And three characters he used were Bu Chu To. What's that mean? Bu Chu To. He also said, Tao Guang Yang Hui. Tao Guang Yang Hui is an exact quote from one of these rising powers during the Warring States period. Tao Guang Yang Hui means keep your strength secret. Bu Chu Tao means don't stick your head out. Because a lot of Chinese hardliners were saying, look, the Soviet Union's collapsed. Russia's half the size. The GDP is even less than that, than what it used to be. Now it's China's turn. And Deng Xiaoping said, no, don't ask the weight of the cauldrons. And that advice was followed until 2008. The financial crisis happened in the West. The Chinese began to say, look, this Western model, this Western arrogance, this Western narrative about how universal values depend on doing things the American way or the European way, that's all wrong. The financial collapse happened. Now it's China's turn. China's model might be universal, or at least good for China. So the Chinese military buildup began. And China went from very few nuclear weapons to a lot more. China went from almost no missiles to first 500. They said, don't worry, we're just going to stay at 500. Then to 1,000. Don't worry, it's just going to be 1,000. 1,500, 2,000, 2,500. Chinese, when they asked by the Pentagon, what's this all about? He said, don't worry, it's not about you. These are short-range missiles until they began to deploy long-range missiles. 
And then the Pentagon got even more excited, 2012, 2014, Chinese began to test secretly a missile designed only for one thing, to find a large aircraft carrier a thousand miles out from China and sink it. Very hard to do. Many reasons why it's very, very hard to do that. China said, don't worry, this is just a test, it's not, never going to happen. Fast forward three more years, Pentagon announced China now has an operational anti-aircraft carrier missile. Chinese said, don't worry, it's just going to be five, no big deal. Number much higher now. So nuclear weapons, anti-aircraft missiles, anything else the Americans depend on? have a chapter called the Assassin's Mace. The Assassin's Mace means a kind of Tang Dynasty weapon system you hit somebody with when they least expect it, when their most vulnerable point. Anybody know where the most vulnerable point of the United States Armed Forces is? I'll wait for a guess. What's, what's the United States rely on the most? Okay, we've got one nomination, electrical grid. Oh, I think I hear satellites. That's the correct answer. After the first Gulf War, the United States revealed something very, very secret. The Congress asked, well, gee, how did you win this first Gulf War? 1990-91. Pentagon decided, well, we're going to explain. We have all these satellites in space. We can listen to people. We can take pictures of people. We run the GPS. We can tell the cruise missiles where to go. We can check bomb damage after it happens. And one expert testified to Congress, 90% of our combat power comes from our satellites in space. Because at the time, apparently, unfortunately I was there, the idea was, no, these satellites are invulnerable. They're too high up. They're too small. Nobody could ever find them. You have to be really, really smart to have a missile that could go quickly, high up several hundred miles, find a little satellite, and destroy it. If you could do that, you could cripple the system that the U.S. Armed Forces depend 90% on. What do you suppose the Chinese said about that? When they were asked, are you ever going to try to develop an anti-satellite weapon system? What'd they say? That'd be asking the ways of the cauldrons. If you gave the wrong answer, like, sure, we need that. Because you Americans are coming for us as soon as we start to surpass you. No, Chinese said no. We would never dream. In fact, they even introduced a treaty in Geneva to ban all weapons in outer space. Then in January 2007, the Chinese shot down one of their own satellites and kept it secret until the United States and seven other countries asked China's foreign ministry for an explanation. And the Chinese foreign ministry said, we don't know anything about that for 10 days until they came back. They said, yes, it's, don't worry about it. It's just an experiment. So you see where the book is taking you? The 12 steps are, first of all, competition. Be, be aware that we're now in a competition with China. Doesn't mean war, doesn't mean confrontation, but it means thinking differently than giving all of our technology, capital investment, business school professors, wonderful new ideas in science, giving them all to China because China is poor and backward and kind of stupid. That way of thinking is, was wrong. That's step one, recognize the problem. I won't give you all 12, because then you won't buy my book. But one of them is, be aware of the reformers versus the hardliners debate and what we can do. Does the United States want the hardliners to win in Beijing? Of course not. We want the reformers to succeed. But who are the reformers? And how is it possible to help them? So I would conclude by saying I think President Trump understands this problem, has been working on it, and deserves an A or an A-plus 
for converting his campaign rhetoric where he said things like, China has been raping us and I'm not going to stand for this anymore. He's converted his campaign rhetoric into actual action with the cooperation of the leader of China. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. Not just the Mar-a-Lago summit. They met again in Beijing. Xi Jinping took President Trump to areas no other foreign leader has gone to. They signed a series of agreements. President Trump said, I have a new strategy. It's a free and open Indo-Pacific, and China can join. Of course, there was a trick, quest, quit trick condition. You can't join unless you have a free and open political system. So I think there's a lot more to come in terms of President Trump's China strategy. But the positive support from the Chinese side for the trade agreement, the first phase and now the opening to the second phase, I think is a miracle. The second phase, just to conclude on this point, the second phase goes back to what I told you about national champions, subsidies, uh, no real market prices. The second phase is to ask the Chinese to please abide by your promises. When we supported you to join the World Trade Organization, you signed a long list of things you would do. And one of them was reduce subsidies to the national champions. You can't have a free market if you have subsidies for all your state-owned companies. So that is where we're going in the next year. President Trump has said he doesn't think this will happen until after the election. But in the meantime, he wants to visit Beijing and see Xi Jinping and try to make progress on the phase two of the trade talks. Now I'm leaving out the military balance, what's been happening there. I'm leaving out a number of other issues involving uh, friction in the US-China relations. But overall, I'm optimistic. The only problem is the chances of war have been going up. There used to be a taboo, mutually res res respected taboo. Our military journals of the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps never had articles about a war with China, let alone how to win a war with China. Chinese periodicals had the same taboo. The most people would say might be a certain kind of enemy might do this to us. All that's changed. Over the last roughly 10 years, more and more journal articles written by active duty military officers are talking about war and how to win it on both sides. The forces of both sides are in more and more frequent contact without having, a, without having agreements or uh, protocols to respect each other's tra trajectories and missions. So yes, Dr. Pillsbury is optimistic. This is all wonderful. Everybody's awakened. In the last five years, we're more competitive, but we're still getting along just fine. President Trump called it just two weeks ago, the best relationship with China ever is the one we have right now. On the other hand, the possibilities of war have gone from very low to perhaps higher. So I hope that gives you enough uh, material to thank me for coming, but also to buy this book. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Dr. Pillsbury. Uh, I was wondering if I could get your opinion on the gap in educa the education system between the United States and China. Uh, I was doing a reading, and it said that part of the reason why we're falling so behind is because China is educating its children in STEM and math, or science and math, much better mm -hmm. than we are. I think a lot of people are worried about that. The National Science Foundation has uh, indicators that it measures of who is graduating, how many engineers, and how many people in hard sciences. Uh, even correcting for population, we 300 million, there are 1.4 billion. The, the, more, the more tricky issue in many ways is the so-called Thousand Talents program, where the United States government, US government is discovering more and more that Chinese students or researchers have not been studying Shakespeare or the poems of Walt Whitman. They're not coming to America. There's almost 400,000 Chinese students now. Most of them pay full tuition, by the way, so it's billions of dollars to American universities. But they're not studying, uh, think of another example, flower arrangement. They're studying hard sciences in laboratories and they maintain contact with their host institutions back in China. <clears throat> so the FBI claims that it has as many as 1,000 investigations underway right now into Chinese economic and technology espionage. The Department of Justice, dating back to the Obama period, the Department of Justice has something called the China Initiative. It's to prosecute and put in jail individual Chinese stealing technology under the guise of being students. So our STEM system needs help, needs a lot of improvement, no doubt about that. But a, a more serious threat is if in a guided way, somebody back in China is targeting, okay, this guy and his team are the world's best artificial intelligence experts, and they're at Harvard. First choice, sign a contract with them, give them $500,000, you, you turn over your, anything good you come up with in your lab. Second choice, espionage. We basically had no defense against this up until recently. A very similar problem was discovered in the Silicon Valley over the last five or six years. Everybody thought Chinese companies come in and buy, you know, high-tech companies in Telecon Valley, no big deal, free market. Anybody can invest in any place they want. Then some people, and it's especially written up by a guy named Michael Brown, in a report called the Defense Innovation Unit. It's a Pentagon office in Silicon Valley. It turned out there's a pattern to acquiring small firms Chinese joint venture companies acquiring small firms that were targeted on really important new technology. So by vote of roughly 400, 400 to 4, nothing ever passes the Congress anymore in a bipartisan way, some people say. In the case of the reforms on these Chinese investments to buy high-tech companies, it passed 400 to 4 in the House of Representatives. So in the past, all of these purchases of American high-tech companies by China were only if you volunteer for scrutiny would the government look into it. Now it's, it's up to the government to look into it. So the whole issue of STEM is part of a larger family of issues. Who has the best technology innovation system? If you want to be fancy, you can say technology innovation ecosystem implying that it's a very broad set of uh, factors, rule of law, patent protection. Uh, there are many, many factors to technology innovation ecosystem. But th those sounding the alarm, again, beginning with the Obama administration, said there seems to be a targeted attack on our technology innovation system. And of course, what did the Chinese say about that? Yes, we're targeting your best technology so we can continue our quest to surpass you? No. Chinese said, this is just coincidence. Nothing to it. 
So I think by now the Congress has spoken, the new system is at work. If you want to show off, you can use the word CFIUS. Who knows what CFIUS stands for? Put your hand up. Oh, just one? The Shanghai guy has his hand up on everything. What's CFIUS stand for? That's right. Very small, didn't do much, based on voluntary scrutiny only, now totally changed. Uh oh, Shanghai Peng Yo. Tisho. Okay. You're gonna you try to win the book with a with a question I can't answer? By the way, I should mention, in, pres in praise of President Trump, the first phase trade agreement, a lot of it is about technology protection and penalties that China has agreed to for companies caught engaged in technology theft. Okay, Mr. Wu. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming. So, uh, like you said, I am a Chinese student. I can assure you I'm not here to undermine the West, <laughs> although maybe it's just uh, you know, me equivocating. Um, but then what, what you said about, uh, you know, the 400,000 Chinese students studying about the U.S. and potentially committing espionage, um, yeah, it's currently uh, true that the FBI is conducting a lot of uh, investigations on these cases. And, uh, but the president of Columbia University, Bollinger, had an op-ed recently uh, where he said the FBI requested him to uh, surveil uh, the Chinese grad students, and he refused to do so. Uh, on one point was because he felt uncomfortable, you know, spying on his own students. But the second point was that the vast majority, nearly all academic research is uh, open, you know, by definition, mm -hmm. to disseminate. It's very rare to have any classified research going on at university laboratories. So there isn't really anything to steal or mm -hmm. uh, conduct espionage on in the first place. I think the problem is everybody thought that, what you're saying now, that Research and scholarship is basically open. There's nothing classified about it. People are just, the Chinese students are just doing everything proper. Everybody thought that was the case, I would say, as recently as 10 years ago. The only problem is a number of individuals, not Chinese as such, but individuals, have been caught and confessed doing this kind of thing. I have a whole chapter on it. You'll be happy to know in my book there's a whole chapter on uh, economic espionage and these specific cases. Uh, sometimes the case shows just how sensitive the technology being stolen was and it's not usually classified. Technology before it becomes known to the military can't be classified but it can be sensitive and it can be important. So I believe China should be allowed, even encouraged, to buy American companies. China bought the, Wal the uh, Waldorf Astoria in Manhattan. Superhawks say that's bad. We can't have China buying the Waldorf Astoria, even though it's quite a high price. I say that's good. China buying American real estate, I'm all for it. Helps the US economy. But when a small Chinese team comes in and wants to buy something, goes with a nuclear submarine. And China doesn't have any nuclear, has problems with nuclear submarines operating. Then I get more concerned. So it's very tricky. Nobody wants to be racist and say all Chinese in America are bad. There's got to be a way where the FBI and other investigators are very careful to only investigate cases that are real and that there's some basis for it under rule of law. And that's the problem. I'm, I don't know how many Chinese out of the 400,000 are stealing technology. But think about it. 400,000, the FBI says it has 1,000 cases. Well, that's 399,000 Chinese students who are doing the right thing. It doesn't strike me as particularly oppressive if it's one in 400. What do you think? This is for the video to oh, okay. get your comments. Um, yeah, first of all, you mentioned that those are uh, cases that are just currently being investigated. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean they're found guilty yet. That's right. Um, but you mentioned uh, economic espionage, and I, I just was trying to differentiate between 
you know, stealing intellectual property by buying U.S. companies or forming for, uh, joint ventures in China. I think that's a separate issue than the academic side that we were mentioning of these students. That in these labs, um, I still believe there's like it's still open um, information. There's nothing to steal. Economic espionage is a is a separate issue, I believe. Mm -hmm. And these students don't engage in that. Uh, right now, the professors or students have been prosecuted have mostly been because they didn't uh, disclose all their foreign funding, especially from China. Like the head of the Harvard uh, Chemistry Department, it seems that. He didn't necessarily uh, sell anything in Chinese or no one stole anything, but they broke rules where they were supposed to disclose funding. Mm -hmm. I agree. Don't you think this is going to be a real challenge? I mean, it would be a disaster to over-target every Chinese in America when, in fact, the problem could be a very s small number of cases. But to do nothing is no longer an option. There's been enough revelations already that uh, that's the U.S. government, beginning under President Obama, knows now it has to do something about this. So every FBI office in the United States now is looking into this. Okay, am I finished or there's more questions? Uh-oh. You want to call on individuals? Well, there's three right here in front of me. Well, this guy promised a hard question. You. Okay. Um, to go along with what you said, uh, Chinese military taps U.S. University Post, today's second page of the Wall Street Journal. So what you've just been discussing is apropos. But uh, I have another question. Nowhere in your uh, presentation did you mention uh, civil rights and issues in China that <laughs> may throw a monkey wrench in any political discussion that President Trump has with uh, the head of China because we, o we always know there's elements in the U.S. Uh, Congress who want to throw that up anytime somebody's trying to negotiate a deal with any foreign power. So where do you see this being a, a problem with, uh, you know, just let, let's talk about re, uh, freedom of religion and, and ethnic groups in China that are being persecuted. So y you left good that question. out, but I'm just curious if you have a No, point. no, it's a very good question, and I left out Thank something you. else uh, really of great importance, the bipartisan cooperation in our Congress on China not just the reforms of the uh, Committee on Foreign Investment that passed 400 to 4, but also uh, just two weeks ago, there's a conference in Munich um, that Nancy Pelosi went to along with Secretary of State uh, and Secretary of Defense, and one reporter wrote an article about it. He was astonished. He, Nancy Pelosi made a speech and said Huawei is really bad, she, worked in human rights, uh, Uyghurs in Xinjiang, uh, really kind of demonized China as a whole. And the reporter put his hand up. I wasn't there. I just read this in the Wall Street Journal. The reporter asked, Speaker Pelosi, it sounds like you're agreeing, you're aligning yourself with President Donald Trump's China policy. Now, this is the speaker who just tried to impeach him they trade insults on a regular basis. What do you suppose Nancy Pelosi said to the reporter? It's a yes or no question. It sounds like you're aligning yourself and agreeing with President Trump's China policy. What did Nancy Pelosi say? Anybody? Who said that? Okay. She said yes. So on many of the issues I'm talking about, when this book first came out five years ago, is not well received. This guy's an alarmist. Surely it can't be that bad. Not anymore. Now, Democrats and Republicans, in a way, are out competing each other to see who can correct some of these wrongs that China has inflicted. And the Chinese response that this is not true, all this is fake news, it's not going over very well especially not with Nancy Pelosi. Okay, you can pick your last two questions. Uh, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Pillsbury. Um, what, uh, what are your thoughts on the, and I, I think this is partially reflected in what you've already said, but on, on the Thucydides trap and, and kind of the, the talk about, you know, I think, it, based on what you said, it seems pretty apparent that you know the con a, a conflict between the U.S. and China is not necessarily inevitable. 
why do you think that's the case if, if that is indeed what kind of you, you believe? Well, you know? I, I take a, a larger view than Graham Allison in the Thucydides trap. I think what he's identified is the problem of accidental war or war that's caused by misperception. And when I was getting my PhD in political science, you could not get your PhD unless you gave the right answer to one particular question. What's the cause of war was the question. What's the cause of war? And some people who failed would say, well, oil. People fight over oil. Or borders. Fights are over borders. It causes war. Or a struggle for resources. All kinds of, you know, wild answers. Good way to not get a PhD, at least not at Columbia University. The correct answer was there are six or seven books on the causes of war by political scientists. They do not agree, except one thing seems to precede all major wars. Any guesses? Miscommunication, misperception, belief that I'm stronger than the other guy. Because no loser, weaker power, in theory, should ever start a war. The major power. They're going to lose. So why do wars happen? Misperception. So the so-called Thucydides trap thesis is really part of a larger quest in political science and international relations theory and in the intelligence community where are likely wars that could break out? What can be done to stop them, if possible? What do you look for? Misperceptions, miscalculation of military forces. So do we have that between Beijing and Washington? Does everybody understand each other perfectly, you think? How many people here, raise, raise your hand, US and Chinese governments, US government and Chinese government understand each other perfectly? Put your hand up. Oh dear, nobody. U.S. and China have misperceptions. Put your hand up. Oh dear, it's 100%. I've just told you the academic theory of the cause of war is misperceptions and miscalculation of the balance of power. What do we read in Chinese military journals over and over again recently? We can take the Americans. One Chinese general I know not too long ago gave an interview to the newspapers. Say, so next time one of these American destroyers goes through our territorial waters on a so-called Freedom of Navigation Patrol, we need to sink that ship. Then he went on to explain that American aircraft carriers are even bigger. They have 5,000 sailors on board. So this is the relationship I described to you with secret cooperation in other countries. Now it turns into Chinese generals and admirals saying, we need to sink some American ships. Does that show a sense of confidence on the part of the Chinese military? I would say yes. I would say yes. They're not quaking in their boots that the Americans can, you know, win. So that's dangerous. We have time for one last question. Thank you for your speech. Um, your I'm curious. Your not working. I'm curious as to why the Trump administration left the Trans-Pacific Partnership, considering the Obama administration had similar goals in mm -hmm. isolating China in the Asian region. And why do you think he did that? And how did it advance the US strategic interests with relation to China? OK, good question. Very frequently raised question. Both candidates for president in 2016, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, opposed the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. There was pressure from labor unions in the case of Hillary Clinton. And in the case of President Trump, he had a different sort of strategic approach to trade. He feels the US can get better trade deals when it's bilateral between different countries than when it's one multilateral um, coalition against the Americans. And his concept was we take the good parts out of the TPP, protection for worker rights, protection to strike, uh, environmental protection, health protection, all uh, there's quite a long list of things that were in the TPP. We take that, those lists of conditions, and we apply them in the bilateral agreements. 
that we make with Japan, Korea, China, uh, Great Britain, uh, India. And it's hard to argue against President Trump because when you think about it, just in your own life, what is easier to negotiate? You against one other person or you against 12 other people focused on you? That seems to be President Trump's concept. So I'm not too worried about the TPP. I've noticed the uh, Democrats who liked it so much, one by one, they've backed off. And they've said, yes, these protections and conditions we can apply in other trade agreements. Dr. Michael Pillsbury. <laughs>